All right, welcome into another Carolina podcast, a special no huddle edition that we're going to do every Monday during college football season. And uh, of course, uh, talking about the Gamecocks, thirty-four to fourteen loss at Missouri on Saturday. I'm Wes Mitchell with Chris Clark, and Chris. I, I guess we'll just dive right into it. Obviously, um, you know, looking on our message boards, looking on social media, you know, Gamecock Nation uh, upset right now, and you know, rightfully so. I, I think whether you thought South Carolina was going to win the game or not, uh, which I, I think we all sort of felt like they got there and, and play well, felt like it was going to be a pretty evenly matched game um you, you know right right now I, I i don't even know how to say it i feel like this team feels somewhat uh snake bit i feel like whatever can go wrong is going wrong right now and you know you go into this game like we said you know Ve- vegas had it as a nine and a half ten point um you know missouri favorite we all thought that was high uh, vegas once again proves they know more than everyone else and um uh, you know, South Carolina right right off the bat has a really really weird play, and is uh, you know you're already dealing with with Ryan Helinski playing with a, an elbow that depending on who you ask is is at least been sore during the practice week, which has limited his practice time. May or may not have been still sore during the game, but he clearly doesn't look like himself. Then you have this really weird negative play um, that results in a Missouri touchdown. Uh, just it feels like right now whatever can go wrong for this football team is going wrong. Yeah. I mean, Wes, the only thing that I guess you could say in terms of positive for this football team is they haven't been completely snake bitten by the injury bug. Like we saw last season. I mean, Mm -hmm. um, they have, you know, obviously they're missing their senior quarterback and uh, Ryan Holinsky stepped in against Southern and, and against Alabama and played quite well. Um, but even even he was dealing with the elbow soreness and, and was not effective, uh, not as effective as we anticipated. He did have some pockets later in the game where he played a lot better, obviously. But, you know, they've stayed healthy at running back in terms of, you know, the top two guys. They've stayed healthy along the defensive line in terms of their starters and uh, receivers and things of that nature. But they, they haven't broken through with – a win of any quality. I mean, a Charleston Southern domination being the only one, you know, I, I think Wes, if we were sitting here right now and talking about a team that was two and two, there'd be some mm-hmm. upset people, but it would be not as much. I think going into this season, you know, what did we circle in these first four games? It was a win against Charleston Southern. It was a loss against Alabama and then it was a win against North Carolina, and probably, realistically, uh, you know, uh, sort of a toss-up against Missouri. I did pick the Gamecocks to win, even with that North Carolina loss and based on what we saw the past couple weeks. But that was a game where would anybody have been completely shocked if you picked Missouri? I I don't think so, not even going into this season. I remember when you and I were talking before this season about, you know, what, what do we see maybe the final record being? And I, I counted a North Carolina win. I mean, I still have surprised that South Carolina lost that football game. And then, if you remember, I said, I think South Carolina has a chance to steal one, um, you know, maybe that they shouldn't win, and then drop one that they should or one of those swing games. And two games that I picked out, I think maybe we both picked these, Missouri and then Tennessee on the road, as bad as Tennessee's been. Mm-hmm. You know, Missouri and Tennessee on the road. So, Really, the biggest, I think, shocker was that North Carolina loss, but I think it's just made it difficult to swallow for people that, you know, they look so bad against North Carolina, you lose that game. It's on the heels of losing in Charlotte in the bowl game and looking so bad. Then you go and, you know, lose to Missouri and and look at times pretty bad doing it as well. It's just been a difficult pill for folks to swallow, and I completely understand it because there was – I don't want to say this team was hyped, um, because the schedule was very difficult, but this was supposed to be Will Muschamp's best team, and it just hasn't gone right in those two losses. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, going into this game, I I felt like if they could pressure Kelly Bryant into some mistakes, um, then South Carolina would have a good shot of winning the game. Now, I, I you know, expected Ryan Helensky to go out there and, and be able to have some, you know, a pretty good amount of success. I mean, I, I think the kid's a great football player. And, um, you know, I, I expected South Carolina's offense to be able to move the football. 
And then if you force Kelly Bryant into some mistakes, then, you know, South Carolina wins the game. And I, I think you, you got a couple of mistakes from Kelly Bryant. You have, of course, the uh, almost a pick six uh, that, that leads directly to a South Carolina score from the one. Um, you had a fumble that wasn't by Bryant, but was, you know, by one of their running backs that put the offense in a great position to get a score and they, they get nothing out of it. I think the, probably the, the part that stings the most for the fan base right now about this loss is for one that, you know, the final score isn't even particularly close Two, I felt like Missouri took advantage of South Carolina's mistakes, whereas South Carolina didn't as much take advantage of Missouri's mistakes. That, that game was very, for, for much of the game, even though South Carolina was playing poorly, um, Missouri sort of let South Carolina hang around. And I, I felt like early on in the game, they were getting some pressure on Kelly Bryant. The defense was doing what it needed to do to keep South Carolina in the game. But, um, you know, if, if you have like 30 yards of offense in the first half, um, your defense is just constantly getting put back on the field. Yep. And, you know, there were times later in the game where South Carolina did not get pressure on Kelly Bryant. But I felt like when South Carolina's defense was – not fatigued earlier in the game. There were some times, I think, when they actually were in more of a conservative rush situation as well, where they're trying not to let Kelly Bryant get to the outside. But, uh, dude, before they got worn down, I mean, Missouri's offensive line is literally having to hold on about every other play <laughs> just to just to give their guys a chance. So that, I thought the defense, especially early on, you know, as the game wore on, they wore down. They couldn't get off the field on some third downs, particularly some third longs that hurt them. Uh, the personal fouls in the second half were obviously a, a bad look for the defense. But I, I thought early on defense gave them a chance. But uh, 54 plays that you're on the field and just in the first half alone, I thought that that wore them down. And I just looking back, I was rewatching the game this morning as we're recording on Monday, um, not getting anything um, after the fumble, you know, in Missouri territory. You go to the sort of diamond look with the carry on joiner. Um, neither of those two plays were particularly executed well. Um, you know, Joyner really didn't have a chance at all on those two plays, and it just didn't look like the team was completely comfortable with those two plays from an execution standpoint. Um, you know, I, it, it just seemed like even when Carolina had their chances, they were not able to fully take advantage of them, and Missouri, for the most part, was. Definitely. And I think that's been a theme this season, Wes, is the opportunistic football. I mean, you look at you look at this game, you just you know, you just outline the situations. I mean, South Carolina had some had some you know, you look at some third down situations that they had and that turnover that they forced where they could have done some things, um, you know, to go get points and they didn't. Um, you look at a lot of plays, they had some open players, you know, mm-hmm. and, and and missed them. Um, they had some other opportunities, whether it's defensively or offensively, to get off the field or to extend drives. They didn't do those. Um, you know, you had some things that were unfortunate. I mean, a really bad pass interference call on Brian Edwards. Um, where, you know, I watched some college football that night and saw the exact same play that wasn't called. I mean, um, you know, that, that's not why they lost the game. But the, the officiating was horrific in the game all around. And, and I mm-hmm. think we saw the same in the Alabama game. I mean, Brian Edwards' long touchdown run, just to give an example for the other side, I mean, Chavis Dawkins has a fistful of jersey on <laughs> yeah. um, the guy's back. And, you know, it's just it's just like, what are you looking at? So, But that's a little bit off topic. Uh, you know, I think missed opportunities in this game. You look at the Alabama game, missed opportunities in that game. I mean, you're on the Alabama side of the field, I think, what, eight different times mm-hmm. um, in good field position, and you come away with points five different times. You're on the one-yard line, you get no points. You look at the North Carolina game, you know, you're up 20 to nine. You force a turnover on North Carolina side of the field and you feel great. I mean, you're in great position. You take a shot on first down, you get a holding penalty. Then you're backed up. You end up punting. North Carolina drives, starts their comeback. So, you know, for this team, when teams are not markedly better than their competition, which when you go up and down the schedule, even preseason, there were not a bunch of games that were should wins for South Carolina. There were a few of them. Then there were some swing games, and then there were some games that were going to be very difficult for this team to win, even if it was the exact team we thought they would be, even if they were markedly improved from last season. So when when the teams are fairly close, you've got to play opportunistic. And 
they haven't done that so far this year. Can can they turn it around going forward? I think that's going to be a huge key. But they got a lot to figure out uh, starting this coming week against Kentucky. Yeah. All right. So I, I've written down a couple of things. We've already hit on a few of them um, briefly, but just a couple of things I feel like if, if we're going to tell the story of this game, we have to dive into a bit deeper. Obviously, Ryan Helensky sort of starts there, I, I think, with this game. And, um, you know, Muschamp was asked uh, on the teleconference on Sunday by Josh Kendall, basically, did he feel that the play of Ryan Helensky was more based on potential soreness lingering from the elbow, uh, pressure by Missouri's front, or just an off day by Ryan Helensky, which I, I think you, you know, Muschamp's answer was that it's probably a combination of all of the above, uh, which is probably true. I mean, in football, we like to sort of pinpoint one thing or even, you know, you look at a game, people like to have a scapegoat for why something happened. Generally, it's a more complicated answer. All, all of the above is, is generally correct. But, you know, just watching Ryan early in the game did not look as comfortable as we've seen him in the past. And I, I had to think, just wa- even watching his throwing motion, that part of that had to be from lingering effects of the sore elbow combined with, I think, the effects of the sore elbow on his practice time this past week. I mean, if it's a senior guy at quarterback who's played in 30 games or whatever, you maybe feel a little bit better about him missing practice time. Um, But you have the elbow, you have the soreness you're dealing with, plus you have limited practice reps anyway. Uh, you know, to me, Ryan just did not look like himself out there. And um, I, I have to think that some of that was from lingering effects, at least, of um, the sore elbow, not just physically, but sort of the, the mental effects of that as well. Um, obviously, there are some throws he, he wanted back. Maybe some of them were not even affected by the elbow at all. We saw he still had the ability to get the football down the field on a couple of long throws. But um, just obviously – not what Ryan was looking for in that game. And, uh, you know, Muschamp mentioned some of the protection issues that were obviously apparent and some, some issues with getting open as well. But uh, I think there were, there were several plays where guys are open. And, um, you know, just for whatever reason, it, it didn't – Helensky physically, to, to me, did not look like the Helensky we've seen uh, the first two games of his career. Yeah, I think it was the imperfect storm of, of, for the offense, really. Um you know, you look at South Carolina comes out. I think you're right, Wes. I mean, to, before I even say any of that, just a general point is that people are looking for a scapegoat when a team loses. And, you know, oftentimes, I completely agree with you, it's not just one thing. Yeah. It's, not yeah, it's one. almost never one thing. It, it's never like. one thing. I mean, if you don't – like, one thing that comes up a lot, and I'm not faulting anyone who asks the question, is just – you know, I was texting you about this this morning, you know, defensive and offensive identity. Well, if you're having success yeah. offensively, your identity can be anything. You can run any type of offense for the most part. You mm-hmm. can go tempo. You can go not tempo. I mean, w- when you're talking about identity, you know, offensively, South Carolina's identity is to, yeah, they're going to run their scheme, but they want to go. <laughs> they want to do all the things that everybody wants to do. You mm-hmm. want to challenge people vertically. You want to get the ball in space to playmakers. You want to run the football. You want to protect the quarterback. High percentage, you want to score points. And you want to use tempo at times. I just described, you know, so many teams in the country that want to do those exact same things. So it's really about how well you call it situationally than how well you execute. And so I think you could argue that South Carolina didn't do those things. Not even argue. I mean, they didn't do those things particularly well in this game. So, yeah, I mean, early on, they had some things dialed up where there were guys open, you know, mm-hmm. and Ryan didn't hit them. Then you had a situation where they didn't have – I mean, they had maybe one play inside zone that worked well, a Rico Dattle first down run. The, yeah. rest, the rest of the runs that had any level of success were some perimeter runs. There weren't many of them. There were also some times, Wes, where they, you know, they were first down and they'd get four or five yards – Mm-hmm. And so it's they're sitting there at second five, second six, and then there's two throws in a row. Yeah. I thought maybe could have stuck with the run a little bit more. Um, some of the stuff probably RPO game, mm-hmm. you know, have to go back and watch. Um, 
but you had that, and then you had you know you had a turn a, a Missouri touchdown early on a sort of a, a play that, I mean, I've never seen that play. You know, I've yeah. seen I've seen a quarterback bat a ball down. I've never seen that exact play. Then you had, I mean, the red zone interception obviously mm-hmm. was a killer because South Carolina is down ten. Uh, they fourteen got point ch- swing. Fourteen point swing. They got a chance to cut it to three. And not only is it a red zone turnover and no points, it's a, it's a touchdown the other way. Like you said, it's a 14 point swing. So, I mean, who knows what happens if they just go down there and score? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, um, it's not excusing the play. It's just it's the reality of how the game played out. I mean, they, they go down there, they've moved the ball, they've had a very nice drive. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that the is that the drive where they had the third 19 Halinski pass to Kyle Markway, and then they converted the fourth down? Um, pass on the rollout I believe that might have been that exact same drive I Um, think I I think think, so I was watching it earlier and I think that's what I recall so you know they have a nice drive they get some conversions Mm -hmm. um you know they move the ball they had a little pass to shy smith where he made some things happen and um they get down there knocking on the door of a touchdown and and then that happens and so unfortunate deal but yeah I mean I I thought in general I think Holinsky's game was it was a combination of probably all those things that you mentioned. Uh, was the elbow maybe affecting him early? Were there maybe some, you know, some some not feeling quite as prepared? Was the protection not as good? Was the run game not there? And all those things were true. So um, I think people are going a little bit overboard on uh, <laughs> on Halinski's performance in terms of just yeah, tr- just really really stretching to make the hot take that he's struggling or something of that nature. He struggled in the game. There's no doubt, yeah. but so did a lot of other people, you know, in that football game. And um, I don't think it erases what we saw the past couple weeks, erases his upside or the fact that he's probably going to be a really good player for the Gamecocks. But um, offensively, just a lot went wrong in that game and sort of, like I said, created sort of that imperfect storm to where they didn't find a lot of success. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. I want to talk sort, sort of basing off the same mm-hmm. sort of conversation already. Play calling, and I'm, I'm, I, I know how I feel about this, and I'm going to try to put it in uh, short enough words to where it actually makes sense. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to verbalize this, is what I'm, is what I'm saying, uh, to where what I'm thinking in my head actually, hopefully, is conveyed. But I think first of all, uh, we get caught in this thing of well, play calling means either the play worked or it didn't, which um, to me is not what play calling is about you can have a good play on and it doesn't work out you can have a bad play on and it does work um you know it's easy to sit here and say uh sort of blindly South Carolina should have run the football more in the first half and uh you know you can probably make a very compelling argument that that is the case um but I, I think when you get start getting to the question of well, why why didn't they run the ball more why didn't Rico Daddle Tavian Feaster get more touches um, you know, and then you say, well, if, if this, your freshman quarterback is on the road for the first time, your freshman quarterback is in a situation where the elbow maybe is or isn't right. All we do know is he definitely was limited in practice. Don't you want to try to lean on the running game? Absolutely. Perfect world. Yes. Now I think when you have so few plays in a half in the first place, um, you, you have, you have to get first downs and stay on the field in order to sort of get to the rest of your offense, I feel like, if that makes any sense. Like, your, your first sequence of plays, whether they're runs or whether they're passes, have to have some semblance of success to sort of find any rhythm on offense, I think. And, um, you know, is it the chicken or the egg? You know, what comes first? You know, do you have to have rhythm to stay on the field or do you have to stay on the field to have rhythm in an offense? <laughs> you know, in, any offense looks great when – you know, you're, you're having success. You start to put the uh, opponent on their heels a little bit. You can get to some tempo after you make that first first down. Um, you know, then teams have to start accounting for everything. I, I feel like you're, the first first down on the drive is the most important first down of a drive, in my opinion, because it sort of just sets the momentum for that drive. Um, should South Carolina have gotten the football to Rico Daddle and Tavian Feaster a bit more, um, 100% in a vacuum? Absolutely. Um, if Halinski is able to hit a couple of those early throws for first downs, 
and then the defense has to loosen up a little bit and South Carolina stays on the field, do Rico Daddle and Tavian Feaster then get the football more? I would say yes, absolutely, no doubt. Um, does South Carolina have to maybe get in some situations where, as Muschamp likes to say, you call it and haul it, where it is more a designed running back call as opposed to a call where you're letting the defense dictate if you run it or throw or throw it? I, I think yes. At some at some point, you have to be a bit more hard headed in the running game. Um, all that said. If Missouri is playing with an extra defender in the box, which they were most of the time, early on they're playing man coverage, single high safety, that means your your other safety is up in the box against the run. Then if you don't feel like you can run it against a stacked box and you run the ball on first and second down, because everyone says, well, protect your quarterback, et cetera, et cetera, run the football. If you run the ball on first down and second down and get three yards total, you're actually doing – your quarterback the opposite of doing him favors. You're doing him a disjustice because now you're putting him in third and long, pure passing situations, right? So I, in theory, I like the idea of, okay, let's get Polinsky easy passes early, loosen up this defense, force that safety out of the box. Then the running game actually opens up, and basically Missouri's playing to take away the run, so you give him these easy throws. Now, when those throws don't hit, then you're in third and long anyway, and then you know you don't get the ball to your running backs. You have 30 yards of offense. It, it makes you know everybody looks bad. So I, I get in theory why they were throwing the football early on, trying to get him easy throws because you don't want to put him in those third and long situations. You loosen up the defense, then you start hitting Daddle Feaster, and you can sort of get a little bit of momentum in the running game, wear them down. But if you're not getting those initial first downs. You have no ability to start to wear down the opponent's defense, no ability to get your running backs a rhythm themselves, and then go from there. So um, I, I think – I see what they were doing. Now, there were a couple – you know, maybe a third – there's a third and two I circled early in the game where um, they missed a corner route to Edwards. Now, the, the it's there. It's open. But, you know, when your quarterback's struggling a little bit, they actually ran the football on first and second down of that sequence, you got eight yards. Yes, Missouri has an extra guy in the box, but it's only third and two. You had two tight ends in the game. Um, at some point, you have to trust your back can get two yards and maybe start to be a little bit more hard-headed in the run in that situation in hindsight, I think. Um, does anything I just said make, <laughs> make sense? It, it does because, um, you know, and look, at the end of the day, People want results. We say it all the time. Results driven business. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you don't you don't point to what happens on the field at the end of the day or after a period of several years and say, "Well, it was this and it was that," and you don't know how the game unfolded. I mean, at the end of the day, it's results driven, and so that's why we're sitting here talking about a loss, and that's why people are upset. But it's our job to sort of break down what happens, why things happen, try to lend some context to it, and so yeah, I, I, I definitely see what you're saying. Um, the other thing to remember is like there's another team on the field with pretty good players and there's other coaches who are pretty smart too for the most part. And so when things happen, like you say, Wes, you know, you, you come out Missouri and, and South Carolina, they have their game plans going in as to what they think the other may do. The game mm-hmm. starts, it starts unfolding. Then you start adjusting on the fly. So one thing that South Carolina has to adjust to is – you probably don't really know exactly how Ryan Holinsky is going to react. It, it becomes pretty apparent, and he does get better during the game, actually, in terms of his accuracy. But at least early on, he's sailing some throws. He's pulling some throws wide. He's not very accurate. Missouri can then understand and, and dictate their coverage and how they're playing of, okay, the quarterback's erratic right now. Let's make him, you know, let's probably man up. Let's, let's roll some extra help down. Um, let's play the run. And that makes it tough because then, again, you know, they've got extra guys in the box. So then that's when South Carolina can say, you know, your counter move, your, your pretty obvious counter move there may be to, unless you're in those short yardage situations, I agree with you, you got to try to run the ball there. But your counter move is, okay, pass the ball. Mm-hmm. Or, okay, okay, RPO. Um, that the, the interception, the pick six uh, that we referenced earlier, 
Muschamp said on his television program afterwards that that was actually an RPO concept as well. Um, mm-hmm. It was sort of quick. I mean, Ryan pulls the ball almost immediately um, and, and throws it and, and does not make a good decision. But, you know, Muschamp said that's something they'll have to go back and look at. He said we probably should have run it because the defense dropped off. So, you know, in that situation, maybe not a good read by Ryan. We can we can always hindsight twenty twenty and say, well, don't call an RPO there. You know, just just either run the ball or call it pass. And hey, yeah, maybe you should. But you know, you're down there. You can sort of understand either way. But I think it's interesting that on Sunday night, Muschamp said, and we've heard this before. You know that the whole call it and haul it concept, Wes. I don't know if he used that exact terminology last night, but he did say that. You know, they're going to have to look at. Mm-hmm. You know, running the, you know, calling more straight runs, straight passes. I, I don't think they'll scrap the RPO stuff because they've had some success with it in the past. Yeah. Um, but I think they got to take a hard look at everything that they're doing because they've got to, you know, they got to figure it out from here on out. But, but I do agree with you. I mean, everything gets under the microscope when there's not success. Yeah. And if, if you can't run it and if you're not passing it with success, it, it makes it hard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if you're if you're three and out, it's hard to get to all the other stuff you want to do on offense when you only have those three plays on a drive. You know, like you you have to you have to stay on the field to get to all the other. And like you said, you know, you made a good point when you were describing what South Carolina wants to do on offense. That's almost every offense in 2019. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody wants to stretch the field vertically. Everybody wants to make everybody defend the entire field horizontally. Everybody wants to have some form of tempo. At least if they want to get to it, they want to have that in their repertoire. Um, everybody wants to do the same things in general, but you have you have to be able to stay on the field to to sort of do that. Uh, but yeah, I, I I think the Mush Camp's point. Yeah, you don't you don't scrap you don't completely scrap the RPO stuff, but there are times when you have to say we need to run the football here, and we're gonna see if we can actually sort of enforce our will on the opponent here because, it, hey, if it's third and two and everybody in the stadium thinks you're going to run it, and, and yeah, in a, again, in a perfect world, if, if the Ryan Helensky from the first two games is out there and you run that corner route and he hits Edwards, um, you know, another big play, first down, momentum, then you get to some tempo, then you do run the football, then, you know, it, it's a great call. But I, I think in the – like you talked about adjusting to the situation within the game we were in at that time, um, you see that your quarterback's been a little bit ira- erratic, um, then it, it's just it's, it's not the same situation anymore. Then you may have to just grind it out, try to impose your will on the opponent, and, and see where you go from there. So uh, definitely some situations where they could have been a little more hard-headed in the run. Uh, the other thing I had circled, offensive line play. And um, uh, along the same lines, I, I think um, Eric Kimry made a good point during the game on Twitter about some of the uh, – we all talk about the positives of RPOs, but there are also negatives to RPOs. One of those is that at times you're talking about leaving a free rusher that you're then obviously reading, and that in turn can get you get your quarterback hit. That can force him to make throws of the guy in his face. That can force the, the ball to get batted around, stuff like that. So th- there are some negatives running RPOs that can make your quarterback and your offensive line look bad at times. Now, other than those situations where you're getting a free rusher because of the play call, obviously South Carolina's offensive line did not play well enough to win this game. And that's something that we thought, you know, the line had been shored up a bit uh, since week one. But but obviously I I think it's – I don't want to say it's back to the drawing board, but obviously this offensive line is going to have to play better um, for for the quarterback and for the running backs to, to sort of get on track. Yeah, it, it was not a good performance from that standpoint. I mean, you looked at and, – and Will Buschamp pointed out, you know, Alabama and Missouri are two different teams schematically. South Carolina is a little more familiar with how Alabama plays because the way that Will Muschamp structures his defense and how they play their front is how Alabama plays their front, you know, for the mm-hmm. most part. Same with Georgia. I mean, it's similar schools of thought, you know, um, in terms of how they play the front, sort of unique. So – um, th- there's more carry over there. Uh, there's a little more, you know, not only knowledge, but just practical experience. And, and that helps, and that can help your players as well. So um, Missouri brings some different things. They do a good job with their front. You know, they've always been a program that when you think of Missouri, you think of 
you know, defensive line and the ability to create some havoc up front. And when they've been good and had good performances, they're playing well up front. So they were able to do that. Um, I think there were some situations where, you know, one that comes to mind is when DeCarion Joyner came in to run sort of the, the wildcat stuff. And it's pretty obvious that they were what they were going to do in Missouri stacking the line, you know, in hindsight, maybe you try to get out of that situation because, you know, they were coming and I think they lost three yards, you know, on that play. So, mm-hmm. uh, but Missouri won up front, you know, and that's been the strange thing, Wes, is, you know, take Charleston Southern out of it. South Carolina dominated that game on the lines of scrimmage, which they should have. Um, but th- they didn't play well against North Carolina, really on either side of the ball, but they alternated defensively in terms of the front on defense in the North Carolina game. They alternated between getting gashed and playing really well. Mm-hmm. Um Alabama game, they played very well on both lines of scrimmages. I mean, that game was fairly even except for Alabama's play in space. That that was that was the biggest difference. I mean, to be honest. Yeah. You just just the ability to play in space. The lines of scrimmage, South Carolina bought Alabama up pretty well. And, you know, the defensive line, I mean, it was sort of a wash because Alabama gets the ball out so quickly, but uh, they did a good job against the run in that game. This game, you know, you turn it from one week to the other. And South Carolina, in terms, you know, defensive line, I think still did some very good things early in the game. It's tough to contain a guy like Kelly Bryant who can move around. And they did a pretty good job with that early in the going. I thought the offensive line uh, took a step backwards. I think Missouri played well. They had a good plan. And I think the line just didn't play as well. And the fact that South Carolina was so inconsistent offensively, that can certainly affect your play calling. It can affect your line and all those different things. No doubt. All right, let's talk about at least a couple of positive performances in the game. I thought, um, once again, Brian Edwards played very, very well. He obviously had the had the huge play on the uh, on the screen that goes for a touchdown. Um, he to me, he looks noticeably faster than he has at any other point in his career. Takes that ball to the house. They and they, you know, to their credit, they've done some things to try to get the football in his hands. So far this year, I thought Shy Smith would take over sort of the Debo role on some of the the jet sweep motion stuff. Whereas you know you're either using it as a an actual jet sweep handoff, or you're using it to show you know get the defense to show their hand, or you're using it um, just sort of as as counter movement to to run the football the other direction. Um, he's been very very good. Uh, like you said, the the offensive PI was was awful. I thought the the defensive player actually created the contact. And then Brian eliminated the contact by getting him off of him. And that's what got called, uh, in my opinion, a uh, terrible call. But I, I think, at least for me, in, in an otherwise pretty rough day for South Carolina, uh, I thought Brian Edwards made some plays for this offense and, and did some good things. And I thought defensively, uh, Javon Kenlaw uh, continues to just wreak havoc up front. He, to me, he's been South Carolina's best defensive player. Sometimes it's easy, you know, a defensive tackle spot doesn't always show up in, in the stats. But um, to me, Ken Law has been great all season long. Um, he actually, I was looking at the PFF numbers. He graded out better than anybody on the team. He had six total pressures in the game. One sack, one hit on the quarterback, four hurries. He batted a pass. Uh, he had, this says three tackles, I guess. But uh, he he made an impact in the game. And I, I thought Aaron Sterling defensively did some things as well as far as impacting the quarterback and, and making some plays, forced a fumble. Um, had uh, I think he was credited with two sacks, uh, three hurries, batted a pass as well. Uh, to me, if, if I was sort of just trying to think of a few guys who you want to say positive things about, um, those are three guys I thought played pretty well. Yeah, that would be the ones I picked. I mean – Javon Kenlaw has just wrecked people. I mean, the past couple of weeks, he's just been ridiculous. Aaron Sterling really flashed. You know, I sort of wondered uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, Aaron Sterling, you know, had sort of the knee swelling. And you sort of wondered, goodness, I mean, is he going to be able to – how effective is he going to be the rest of the season? And the answer is he's still, you know, pretty pretty effective. Uh, he had a really nice game. I thought J.C. Horn played well, you know, defensively. Um, had some tight coverage in some situations. Um, you know, obviously in this game, there's, there's more bad than good, but I, I definitely agree with those, you know, with those situations, those guys that you put forth would be probably my same picks. And, 
Wes, just – I mean, I was just looking over some other things because we were talking about that pass interference. That was a huge penalty. Mm. You know, South Carolina is down at that point. I think they're – are they down 20 at that point when they get the PI? Yeah, or no, they're down 17, I'm sorry. 31-14. So, that play is a 41-yard pass. They're down to the Missouri 38-yard line. So, they're in Missouri territory. Mm. But instead, they get the penalty, and now they're backed up to the 11-yard line. <laughs> of their own 11 and then they you know they get so they they they're in third and 20 or they end up at their own 11 uh complete a short pass to Josh Finn now Joseph Charlton hits like a 300 yard punt <laughs> and they're and backs Missouri up to the 25 fortunately you know but yeah uh but it just illustrates i mean even even though South Carolina comes out okay because Missouri doesn't have field position say on their own side or I mean, if you're backed up at your own 11 and punt and you're thinking, okay, the other team has the ball probably like what on their own 40, their own 35. Right. You know, Joe Charlton's so good he backs them up to the 25. But it just illustrates that situation. They've got a chance to go down and they're in the 30. They're knocking on the door of field goal range at a minimum. Instead, they're punting. And then, you know, you look at that. You look at, you know, some other things that, that were self I mean, R.J. Roderick's penalty, which is very not smart play. Um, you, look at, you look at uh, some other missed calls in the game. You look at Ryan Holinsky throwing the, the pick six as a 14-point swing. A lot of plays that, again, if you got two teams that are fairly evenly matched, we said that going into this game, the fairly evenly matched is going to come down to, you know, who, who made a few plays here and there, who, who played smarter, the turnover margin, and Missouri won in those areas in terms of making the bigger plays at two defensive scores. Uh, they made the most of their situations. They played more opportunistic. They played smarter in some situations. So that's why they won. Yeah, and I, I thought, you know, Muschamp made the point defensively. He was very – he was upset. All right, so you start the second half. Offense finally makes a big play, 17-14. to 14. I, I thought a, a big moment in the game was right after that. Missouri gets the football back. They have a third and five. They have a completion for a first down. Then you actually get a a holding call on the first down after that. So this is just a three-point game at this point. South Carolina scored on offense. They have a little bit of momentum. And Missouri ends up with a first and 20, a second and 20, then a third and 10. And you allow them to complete a 14-yard pass for a first down. Um, and Missouri ultimately a few plays later hits uh, the – I think that was a screen play for about 20 yards for a touchdown to go back up by 10. So I, I thought that was sort of a, a turning point in the game as well that gets a little bit overlooked by all the other big plays in the game, all the other mistakes and just weird plays. Um, and then the, the drive right after that is the drive where South Carolina, uh, you know, arguably their best actually – full drive of the game, 14 plays, 72 yards. You have the interception in the end zone that becomes a pick six for Missouri. Then you've come right back with a fumble um, by Rico Dattle on the ensuing drive. And at this point, um, I don't want to say the game is over, but the chances of winning, um, you just you could feel the all the momentum was on Missouri's sideline. And then at this point, Missouri's defensive front is just pinning their ears back. Um, you know, Ryan's obviously banged up at this point in the game, and um, it was going to be very, very difficult difficult for South Carolina to win uh, once it got to about – that was probably, I don't know, late third quarter, early fourth, something like that. So, anyway, and, and then the, the rest is history, as they say. Uh, any, any final thoughts? I mean, you know, big picture, who, who knows what this means. Obviously, you know, we'll talk a ton about that on Wednesday and going into the Kentucky game. We'll, we'll save Kentucky talk for our Wednesday show and – big picture what all this means but um any final thoughts Chris for you uh, just going into the week well I think South Carolina's just got to play more opportunistic football I mean they've got to do you know in terms of turnover margin taking advantage of plays you know when other teams gift you the football um through a turnover you create a turnover um, go do something with it you know third critical third downs we've seen so many of them this year um, South Carolina not getting off the field on third downs. We've seen them miss opportunities to create turnovers. We've seen them, uh, 
make some turnovers of them of their own that have been difficult to swallow, you know, and this is not a football team that's, you know, we, we all thought this would be a, a better football team. I, I do not expect them. If you would have told me right now, they'd be two and two with a loss to Missouri, a win over UNC and Charleston Southern losses to Alabama, Missouri, I would not have been completely and utterly shocked. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, e- even even counting, you know, just what I thought of this team going into the season, but they're they're not where I thought they would be, and one of those reasons is just the lack of of playing, you know, opportunistic football. I think that area they have not been as good. So can they turn that around? I mean, this is not a team that even whether you thought they'd be two and two or you know somehow three, you know, whatever you thought they would be, um, you know. I, I, I just don't – I don't think this team was ever going to be good enough where it could do some of the things on the field that it's done and, and expect success. You know, mm-hmm. those, are, those are the type – you go into a game and you give up 14 points in defensive scores and do next to nothing in the first half offensively, you're not going to win the game. I mean, you're, you're, you're just not if, you, if you're fairly evenly matched with your opponent. So, going forward, they've got some games where uh, maybe on paper they're a little better or maybe on paper they're pretty even. And so mm-hmm. these are the types of things that they're, you know, turnover margin, opportunistic football. These are the types of things that they're going to have to do to find a few wins on the schedule. Yeah, you're right. And uh, for South Carolina, I know uh, the fan base is hurting right now. All of our readers are hurting right now. But um, if you're the football team, you, you got to get right back out there. Can't quit on the season. And you, you got to just keep playing and try to fix some of these issues that, you know, frankly, we all can see them. It's one thing to see them. It's another thing for them to find out how to fix them. So, Anyway, uh, real quick, uh, Chris, we haven't mentioned them at all. You you want to tell everybody about uh, Terry Bishop and Bishop Real Estate Group? Yeah, Bishop Real Estate Group is Terry Bishop and his wife, Becky Bishop. Terry's a former Gamecock quarterback and a huge supporter of the program. Still um, 36 years of experience in the real estate business in Columbia and the Midlands areas. So if you're looking to buy, sell, invest in real estate. He's the obvious choice. Gamecock guy, former Gamecock quarterback, and really good at his job. So 803-665-1442 or facebook.com slash the Terry Bishop team will get you to Bishop Real Estate Group. Definitely, and also want to thank Slotsky's Deli for sponsoring our weekly Slotsky's Pick'em where you can win a $60 free tailgating package from Slotsky's and uh, has an awesome uh, tray of sandwiches, chips, um, all of your, you know, your plates, your uh, silverware, stuff like that, and obviously some cookies, which Pearson Fowler absolutely loves. So Slotsky's Bakery and Cafe, that's at 529 Bush River Road, Columbia, South Carolina, or 1305 Knox Abbott Drive, KC, South Carolina. For Chris Clark, I'm Wes Mitchell. This has been another edition of your Another Carolina Podcast, No Huddle Edition. We'll see you again on Wednesday when we have our in-studio 107.5 edition of Another Carolina Podcast.